Um, welcome. My name is Ben Lauer, and I lead the developer platform team at Tableau. And I wanted to be here just at the beginning to introduce you to your speakers. Um, I will let you figure out, based on how they're dressed, which one of them is a manager at Tableau and which one is the engineer. Um, but I just really wanted to let you know that you are going to hear from a couple of the best folks at Tableau to teach you about web data connectors. So Mario Guzzi is a senior engineering manager at Tableau, and he's worked on connectivity, all types of connectivity problems for Tableau, and manages teams that work on those really hard problems. Jax, or uh, as he may introduce himself, Javier Valderrama, um, he goes by Jax. Jax was so committed to being here today, he took three different flights over this, I think it took him nearly 20 hours to get here. He, he uh, works remotely in Argentina. But Jax, I will say, probably knows more about web data connectors than anyone on the planet. He's been involved with web data connectors since 2015 when we released the web data connector APIs. And he's been instrumental in building our first class connectors like QuickBooks Online that use the web data connector technology that you're going to learn about today. So I just wanted to let you know how great these guys are. I just came from an earlier run of their session. It's packed with content, tons of code. You're going to hear best practices. So without further ado, I give you Mario and Jax. Um, thank you, Ben. Yeah, good luck, guys. Oh, sorry. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Welcome. I hope you're ready to learn a lot about web data connectors. I know we're super excited to be here and give this talk. I think it's clicker. So just so you know where you are, uh, this talk is called Data and Back Again. And we're going to show you how to build a WDC, like we say, from A to Z. Uh, but first, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, Ben did a great job. We weren't expecting that. So thank you, Ben, for that. My name is Mario. Um, I'm from Argentina. Uh, came to the States in 99. Uh, worked at Tableau since 2015. And living in Seattle, I'm an avid finder, uh, fan of the Seattle Sounders, uh, who made it to the postseason for the 10th year in a row. Go Sounders. With me is Jax here today. And I'll let him say anything about himself. Okay, hello. Like? My name is Javier. You can call me Jax. It's easier for non-Spanish speakers. Uh, I became a Tableau employee in um, 2018. No, 2015, sorry. It's been three years. I'm working on web data connectors, and I'm lead the team that is uh, providing the first class web data connectors for you. I am also played the flute. I've been playing the transverse flute for the last 36 years. I'm older than you think. <laughs> and uh, I really love music. My city uh, is Rosario, which is very similar in weather. And uh, we have a very big river by the city. And the humidity is more or less like here, 80% all the time. And you have uh, very beautiful uh, waters to kayak. And that's one of my favorite coffee. Cool, thanks. Uh, let's get started. The Tableau platform covers uh, a bunch of stuff that you can do, from um, extending your dashboard using the extensions API, to doing automation through REST APIs, to embedded pieces uh, in other applications. But today, we're just going to focus about the data connectivity part um, of that platform. So by a show of hands, how many of you have uh, built a WDC before? One, two, three, four. That's great. Well, hopefully after these, there'll be a lot more. Um, there's another talk about writing your first web data connector, which happens later on today, around 3.30. Brett's giving that. If, uh, if you haven't built one, I would highly recommend uh, going over there. But to get us started here, um, I thought we'd go over some quick reminder of, of what, what is it? What's a web data connector? Um, 
So connectivity is super important at Tableau. If you can't get to your data, you know, the conversation stops like super short. And sometimes you know, uh, we do our best to connect to all the data sources that are out there, uh, but we can't get them all. So you're between your data and Tableau. And we put together um, this SDK to build sort of some middleware that allows you uh, to bring the data into Tableau. So basically, a web data connector is an HTML page with some JavaScript behind it uh, that allows you to query remote data, say through a REST API, bring that back to Tableau in a JSON format and make it into a tabular format that can be consumed by Tableau. And so off you go um, in your analysis. Some uh, basic concepts that I want to highlight here. Uh, first, within the shim that you download to get started, uh, one of the most important pieces of that is being aware of the Tableau global object. Uh, that's where all the state and functionality for Tableau is represented. It's, it's your liaison between your connector and Tableau. Uh, Tableau will load the WDCs multiple times, and it does so in phases. And there's three of them that I want to highlight. One is the interactive phase. This is what Tableau uses to first load uh, your WDC. And as the name implies, this is where interaction happens. Say that you have a web data connector uh, that tells you uh, weather information. You may want to ask the user for a zip code so you can give them back what's the weather. This is the stage where that happens. Um, the authentication phase is an optional phase, but there's a lot of uh, data sources that you'll see that require for you to authenticate. We'll show you how to connect to Spotify that requires you to have credentials. And so the auth phase is where this happens. And the uh, framework loads up the authentication page uh, from the remote data source for you to do so. Uh, and finally, the data gathering phase. This is the meat of the work. Uh, this is where your WDC is uh, loaded in a headless browser and where all the data transfer happens um, into Tableau for you to get started. Again, this is just very brief uh, overview of some of these concepts uh, that are gone over um, in, the, in, in the intro talk. We also wanted to put together some reference information, um, including links to previous talks. Uh, Javier and I found that it's, uh, it's sort of hard to find the, uh, the videos for earlier talks. And so include uh, uh, the links in the slides that will be available for you uh, later on. And as you see, this talk is about, all about like reference material um, you know, to help you uh, get started. So next, I feel like I have to tee up the, the, the demo. Um, like Ben was saying, uh, Javier and I have spent over three years uh, building the SDK and building web data connectors. Um, not a lot of people know that some of the first class connectors that you use in Tableau are built using this framework. Um, and uh, so that means that you know, we ate our own dog food for, for a long time. And along the way, uh, we learned a lot, a lot of best practices, um, how to overcome a, a lot of problems that you find when you try to build a complex web data connector. And that's the intent of these talks. For the purposes of this chat, of this talk, we build, we use a lot of people. Javier has built a comprehensive connector that is thoroughly documented and goes through a lot of the problems that we run into and tries to document how to get over them. Uh, if you go to the basic, uh, the intro talk, they'll tell you that the best thing you can do to get started is to steal some code. And what we're doing here is giving you the code to steal. Um, so we highly encourage you to go to the GitHub repo uh, and then clone it uh, and go at it. With that, do you want to get started on the demo? Sure. Uh, before, I would like to express this. Uh, one of the key things or the spirit of this talk and this repo is to share with you all the knowledge we convey during the three years. And this knowledge is not only to open source it for you is for us also to use. So uh, in this repo, you're going to find that uh, there is like 10 times more JS doc than functional code. So there is a 
molecule and the links to the documentation. Why is that? Because we have tutorials. There are a lot of connectors and great connectors out there and we have a very uh, extensive documentation, but it's hard to connect both. In this case, what I did after coming over and over again to uh, respond or to reply to the engineers, why is that? I tried to put everything together so you can use it very easily. So the code is a really um, production quality code, but it's uh, to a super Verbose. You are going to find uh, some cases there and some switches there that will uh, express what is happening so you can understand and then copy the code and reuse it. The repository is open source and it, I would be uh, very grateful if you also collaborate with that and adding comments and, and features if you want. Okay, so here's the repo. In the repo, uh, I'm going to improve this documentation after the TC or as soon as possible. Uh, you can find uh, the information regarding how to set up an application on Spotify, the requirements to set up the local environment, how to uh, briefly uh, publish your application to a server, and for those who doesn't prefer a command line for Git, there is a very, very useful uh, Git client. Some information regarding debugging, uh, some information regarding how to come around uh, course issues during development, and at the end, the link to the official documentation where you can download uh, the SDK and all the documentation regarding web data connectors and the API. Uh, to go um, further, I will assume that you already know some basic knowledge regarding the web data connector, because I, I, I really would like to uh, share with you all the knowledge I have regarding this, but it might take weeks. So we don't really have uh, more time to share this with you, and I'm going through a very, very uh, specific concepts, assuming you know the previous uh, information. Uh, the first thing is the demo. What I need is to set up my server. I will explain this very uh, fast. Why um, do I have to uh, set up my server? It's because this application is using OAuth 2, and I need to have a local server to run the proxy. So very simple, npm start. This will compile the ES6 code into ES5 for cross-browsing uh, compatibility, and then it will start the server here on port 3000. Okay, you go to the application, hello. You just wanted Here's to show server. off it was live code, didn't you? <laughs> okay, I'm signing in. I'm using Facebook credentials to log in. Please don't spam me. Warning, I think we're gonna learn about your musical taste, aren't we? Yeah. It may get scary. Okay, I'm authenticated right now, and the connector is showing me a filter. I will download the data of the last month. As you can see here, we have very simple schemas like tables and some complex schemas like uh, standard connections. We are going to go through these uh, specific items during the talk, so I'm not going to uh, tell uh, very much about that right now. But what I can show you is how the application is retrieving information here. You can see it's informing the data of the table that is downloading, how many rows is retrieving, and here I'm downloading the data about another table. Here's the raw data, and for convenience, what I did before was to create a very simple workbook. I really talk about that. So you can see here that even I'm, if I'm a flutist, I like John Scoffin. My whole life, was learning Bach, and I ended up listening to John Scoffin. 
Okay, my teacher will die. And okay, this is the way you can uh, connect different tables and to show some information regarding that. That's awesome. So just to recap a little bit of what, of what we saw. Uh, we've noticed that a lot of uh, web data connectors that are built uh, connect to data sources that don't require authentication. Uh, they just use one table, um, and, and, and that's it. And so if you, if you remember what you saw, one is uh, using OAuth 2 to connect to Spotify. Uh, we downloaded a complex schema that had a bunch of tables. Some of them were grayed out, which means there's metadata that says you can't instantiate these tables by themselves. Uh, we also had relations already formed in data connections. Uh, we also had UI to inform the user uh, what was going on while the data was downloading. Um, and uh, as you see, we are, we're also handling errors. These are all uh, problems or, or areas where, where we've developed a bunch of uh, expertise over the years. And uh, we're gonna go branch by branch over these things in details. And uh, hopefully, you'll learn a little bit about that. Fantastic. Great. So this is some of the things that I want to know about. One is, when do we use authentication? You mentioned that uh, there was a proxy there. Why do you use a proxy? Uh, what happens? I authenticate to Spotify, and then I refresh the data. Uh, if I refresh again, do I have to authenticate again? Like, how does that happen? Where, where does the code live uh, in the connector and things like that? Okay, fantastic. Uh, so for you to consume it easily, I create uh, one a specific branch for each one of these uh, set of functionality, and it's going to progressively adding uh, code so you can go through all the steps to reach uh, the whole connector. The first one is authentication. So I'm gonna check out the authentication branch. And since, since I want to run this live, I need my script to be built every time I change the branch. And as we used to say, debugging on uh, the simulator tool is really much easier than debugging on Tableau application. So here we're running our local server for um, the simulator, as you can see here. Hello, simulator, fantastic. And let's go to the code. Cool. As I said on the last uh, talk, I like my beans and my meat very separate. That's why I have one class for authentication, one class for the connector, one class for the dictionary. And another thing that we uh, really learned during this day is that every code you don't own is a code that might hurt you. So the best way uh, we found in this case is to wrap all those functionalities into our own uh, facet, we can say, or something like that. And as you can see, I have a wrapper for a shim, which is the Tableau global object. And I will briefly explain you a use case of this here below. There is a way to report to the user, as you say, um, to, to show the user what's happening during the data gathering. And it's using the report progress functionality, but it depends on the version of Tableau you use. And I don't want to switch or change the shim depending on the Tableau version. It, it doesn't scale. But what I do here is to check if the functionality is there. And if it is, I will use it. Otherwise, I just log a message for the engineers to, to see why it's not working. Okay, in this case, it's not a uh, uh, condition to have this uh, functionality, so it shouldn't fail, but we should know that it's happening. In the other case, I wrap the, the connector, the Tableau connector, 
so I can control the Tableau connector, add functionalities, and mostly to explain better what's happening during this session. For example, here. Sorry. If you have any feedback on Javier's code, feel free to stay after the session, let me yeah. know. I'll include it in his performance assessment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as, as you uh, already saw um, previous sessions, or uh, writing uh, code for web data connectors, you have two mandatory uh, functionalities, which are get the schema and get the data, okay? These functionalities are um, the only one that they have to be there. But in this case, we need to handle state. And what, what's the method that, that's used to handle this state before you get the schema and before you get the data? That's in it. You can overwrite the, or shadow the original init function and add your code. In this case, init is going to pass a callback to say I'm done with init and we are going to use it here. And okay, we need to handle authentication. What's that? I need to understand if I'm already authenticated or not, okay? In this case, um, Spotify is using OAuth 2 there are many implementations of authentication and many implementation also of OAuth 2. There are different flavors. So all that is hidden on a separated code which runs on a proxy. And there I also hidden uh, my secrets, the, the, my ID and my secret to hit the API um, app. Why is that? because I don't want anyone to pretend to be me, okay? So I hidden my secret on a separate uh, layer. I used to say layer instead of layer, I learned now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you use that separately and no one can discover that information. I won't go into that right now because it's out of scope, but it's very important that you know the authentication method you have and which are the secrets that you have to hidden from the users to know. Not because of the user, but because of someone that wants to hurt you, okay? And you've documented all, all of that in the proxy code, right? Yes. So people it's can go the there and go. Yeah. And here you have, for example, the AMB template where you can put your credentials and rename it to M file so the application can use it, okay? Well, here, we have two cases. One is I have a token which means I'm already authenticated, and here it says I don't have a token, okay? If I have a token, it means that I can run uh, through the phases that Mario explained before. The phases are three, data gathering, auth, and interactive. On interactive phase is a part where you display to the user the authenticating uh, UI, or you go to the external application app UI, and where you show the filters. For example, uh, did you saw that I selected the last month data to be returned? That's all on the interactive phase. Then you have the data gathering phase where you define the schema and you get the data from the API, and there is a third uh, stage or phase that is the out phase. The out phase is called, for example, when you have a an already saved a workbook and uh, you want to open it and do a refresh extract. You are not authenticated and it needs to be authenticated to refresh the extract. But you don't want to change any setting of your current workbook. You don't want to reset the filters, whatever, okay? So the out phase will prompt the out UI you selected and it will allow you to authenticate and then go back directly to your uh, workbook. I can show you that here. Uh, to emulate that on the simulator, you can switch from advanced and click here. I have already the session saved on this browser for uh, easy uh, documentation. And done. Okay. I'm saving username and password. That's the only information I'm saving here. 
A uh, very important thing is that uh, connection data, which is the system or the object that is used to pass information across the phases. Each one of these phases is blind about the state of the previous phase. Okay, so there is a system to pass information like uh, the filters or uh, the, some selection you did or some state of the application, you, did, you pass it on connection data. In the else phase, the connection data is read only. That's why I'm not saving anything here. And there is then the interactive phase. Now I'm emulating, I'm already authenticated because I have the, the credentials stored and I'm displaying the filters. This is, for example, when you do a uh, edit connection on your data pane in Tableau Desktop. You are already authenticated. You don't need to re-authenticate. And you show directly the filters. And I will change the filter. As you can see here, I have a medium. Same thing, I want to maintain the state. As you can see, last six months is already selected. I will change it. Done. If I want to emulate a new state, I start directly with start the connection, and I'm here. Okay? The simulator is a tool that we also built for ourselves uh, to test the connector in different phases. Like we say, if you're building car stereos, you don't want to have to like go into the car, put a new stereo, turn on the car to test every iteration of the stereo. And so the simulator allows you to test in isolation all the UX interaction that you're doing, how are you getting results from the REST API, and how does your data look like uh, without having to do that in Tableau. Cool. A brief information here is that we need also to handle the non-authenticated state. In this case, the interactive phase will show or display the UI for signing in. If you are on data gathering, it means that you are calling the connector to retrieve the data from the API, but you don't have credentials. It means that if you ain't got no credentials, you ain't got no data. So simple, okay? And in this other case, the else phase, I have no credentials already set, and I want to display the sign. Okay, great. So what's next, or lesson number two? Um, like we saw in the Spotify connector, the, the, the shape of the data, the data model that you're gonna use, if you will, had a lot of different things. It had a bunch of different tables, it had standard connections, it had uh, join only um, tables. Uh, and so, how do you get to that model? Um, you know, it's something that, uh, that I think you put together in the code. And for you to have a reference, if you use some of the connectors today, like QuickBooks Online, you'll see that it brings back over 30 different data views, there's a bunch of standard connections for you to use, and, and the method that you'll see now is, is what we have used uh, to build those things. Fantastic. As on every stage of this, you have the link to the branch. And I'm going to check out that piece of code. And go to the code. Perfect. We're ready to talk about init. You are talking about schema. Perfect. What's the schema? The schema is the way we tell Tableau how we want to shape the data. And it has a very particular way to uh, shape the data, which is tabular. We have a table with columns and rows. Each one of these tables has to have an ID, has to be unique, and each one of the columns of uh, every table has to have information regarding the data those columns hold, okay? The, the schema can be retrieved from the API when the API allows that, or you might need to define the schema by yourself because the API doesn't expose a schema to you, and which is a problem there, is that you might end up finding that the output of your, um, of your data is completely different from what you want to express at Tableau. So you have to be uh, very uh, picky regarding the, the columns you want to use and how you want to translate those tables from the uh, remote names to the local names 
And Tableau allows you to do that with different properties. Each one of these properties is documented here as every part of the code. And you have tables. One of the properties is the ID of the table. And another one is the human readable text for that ID, which might be completely different. Sometimes uh, the databases have uh, very strange table names. And you want to show something useful for your user. Or you might want to use uh, internationalization to translate those column names or those tables for the user to recognize them. Okay? Then you have to define the columns, which is the, the data, uh, the shape of the data this table is going to hold. And each one of these columns has to have an ID, which is mandatory. And then here you can see um, there is the, the regex we use to validate the ID, and you have to follow that. And then there is the alias. We are so far consistent on that. And you can express that column ID into a human readable name. And then you say um, which data or type of data this column is going to hold. For that, I used uh, the original um, dictionary of data types Tableau use. But you can transform, in other cases, uh, the data type the API has into Tableau data types. There are many, for example, there are APIs that instead of saying an email is a string, they use a email type for a string, which is crazy. And you have to handle that by your own. Then you have other information, as Mario said before, which is having uh, predefined joins. What does it mean? I have a specific table, in this case, which is tracked features. But track features by its own doesn't mean nothing because you don't have the information of the track. Okay? So you have to use a separate table as a master table and then do the join with the master table using the tracks IDs. I can express that saying this column, this table is, uh, where is it, the information here? This join only it means that I cannot select that table. I'm going back here. Where is it? Sorry. OK, I'll show it later. Uh, you can go back there. And you saw some deemed tables. Those are unselectable until you select the master table. OK? And here we define which is the master table. I have a foreign key on tracks. And I use the column ID to uh, join those tables. What does it mean? It means that Tableau is going to use this ID, and when it's going to retrieve the data, it will send first the whole tracked IDs to the data gather interface, so I can uh, do my query to the API using the tracked IDs. Okay. This is stuff we learned, for example, on the first version of QuickBooks Online that we shipped. We didn't have any uh, standard connections, and so we were super excited that customers could see all the tables behind, behind QuickBooks Online, and then they're like, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what joins where. And so, and so we had to go back and say, OK, we'll build a set of standard connections that will get you, you know, uh, going on a PNL report or things like that. Um, so if you can, this is like super useful for people doing analysis. All right, what's next? Thus far, we have put together the, the schema that, uh, that will help with the data model. But now we got to get the data. What format does the data come? It depends on uh, where you're bringing it from. In what format is Spotify going to give you the data? However they want to. Uh, and so once you get it, you have to sort of put together some sort of glue to essentially map the data you get back with your schema to actually end up with a tabular data source that is understandable um, for Tableau. And so you have a bunch of examples about how do we do this mapping and, sure. uh, and how do we end up with, uh, with the right table. Fantastic. So we uh, already 
set the schema, we send it the schema to Tableau, here's more documentation, we have in tables and standard connections, here I'm done capturing errors, but I need to download the data. So I'm going to check out the get data branch, and going here, fantastic. And here's my data method. In my data method, I wrap, as I said before, uh, the original get data method to be able to explain us all this. Uh, Tableau will send to the get data the information regarding the table is trying to retrieve. For each table, it's going to ask for that data. Okay, so there is an object called table properties, which will describe the properties of that specific table, including the schema. Then you have a data progress callback, which is used to send the data to Tableau. Each time you have data, you send it to Tableau through this method. Then you have the done callback, which means I'm done, I finished. You can go uh, and uh, get the new table. And there is the table ID, which is used just for convenience and documentation in this case. On the table properties, you will find uh, the filter column ID, which is used uh, on the joins to define which is the table I need to use as a filter. Then the filter values. As I said before, I use the tracks as a master table. I download all the tracks, and then Tableau will send all the tracks IDs through this property, so I can use them to retrieve the track uh, features. And then I have the incremental value, which is used for incremental refreshes. I can ask uh, Tableau to use incremental refreshes and download data uh, from a certain point, and it will send here on this property the last ID or the last value of the data set I have, so I can retrieve the data from there and to the new set. And there is the Boolean uh, value here, which will express I'm John only. Then what I have to do is just get the data from the API and send it to the block. Okay? Let's go and download get data here. Fantastic. As you can see, before I said I like my beans and meat separate. And here have the already uh, seen mapping, uh, sorry, authentication uh, class, the connector class, and we have some new classes. The error helper to handle my errors, the mapping, and the requester. What's the requester? I want a specific class to handle all interactions with the API. I don't want to mix that code with the connector because it's not its concern. It, it just doesn't have to know how the application is downloading the data. It just wants the data, okay? So I have all the interactions with the API on a single file, which is using the library of uh, Spotify Web API node. And here, depending on the data I want to use, I'm going to uh, execute the library method to retrieve the data. All the AJAX or fetch functionalities are hidden also inside that library. Then I have a mapping. Why is a mapping? Uh, you saw on the tutorials that you have uh, a way to say, I want this column to have this value from a very big nest object, okay? But it's very confusing to have that on the connector, so I want a class to handle that. I want to tell this is the table schema, and I want, I want this column to be filled with the data that is on this path. I can define a lookup to uh, be used by the mapping class and to send that data into Tableau. You might find a JSON response, or you can find a, an XML response, and you want to map it in some way or to transform it or you can download a CSV file and you need to know exactly the columns and which are uh, the, the data for those columns. 
and the implementation is found here, for example, on tracks. Here I'm defining the mapping rules. I'm iterating over the columns of the schema and say if the column is the ID, the lookup is ID because it's on the root of the object. But for example, if uh, the key is a key, Spotify will send you a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, a number on an array, but it's not human readable. It's useless for the user. So I want to translate that into a string. And what I can pass to the uh, mapping uh, class is a function to convert that number into the string I want. Same, he same here on mode. And there are other cases, for example, here on albums, where I need to retrieve the information from a deep nest object. To get the artist ID of an album, I have to go to album and then artist, which is an array, and I want the first uh, record of that array and get the ID. Mapping this by hand for every case on the connector is not scalable, it's very error prone, so I want to hide that in a separate way. And that's it. As you can see here on the connector, the connector is only defining the data view, which is a table, and getting the data. And everything is hidden inside the, the specific classes. You make it look easy. Um, based on what we learned, data analysis is, is highly dependent on the quality of your data model. And to be able to have uh, sort of like a comprehensive way to uh, parse, if you will, the data that you bring in in your web data connector and build that model as, as expressive as you can. You know, we'll, we'll just make analysis that much easier. Uh, so this is one of the most important things um, that we've learned uh, through this process. Yes, sometimes you get a lot of data. Say that even on Spotify, say that we were downloading all the songs. How many songs are there in Spotify? Millions and millions of records. Um, you know, we ran into that when we were building uh, Eloqua uh, and other connectors. And so how can we come up with a way in which we can chunk this data, download it you know, chunk by chunk, while letting the user know that's what we're doing, so that they don't think that Tableau is hang. Uh, also, not overloading the, the memory footprint of the connector to not crash Tableau uh, and, and get to sort of like a result data set, uh, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. Do you have an answer for that? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I, I like to consider uh, systems like living things and uh, oh, no. every day's <laughs> life examples used to uh, convey uh, the concept of this kind of stuff. Uh, for example, you have a ton of boxes there and you need to uh, take those boxes out there and put them there. You won't ever take the whole set of boxes because you die. It's just impossible, okay? And uh, it's very likely that you are not able even to move just one of them. So what you do, you pick up the amount of data or the amount of boxes you can handle and bring them in the other way and then take more and put them there. That's called pagination. Some APIs will expose a way to paginate. For example, uh, Spotify, it's using uh, an offset and a limit where the limit is the number of records you want and the offset is a position on the set. So you can iterate over that and move forward the pointer to get more data. And also in uh, Spotify, you have a, um, API endpoints that use a limit set of data. For example, on the tracks features, you have to send the tracks ID to get the features. But it has a limit of tracks ID you can send. It's 100 or so. So you can retrieve the whole data for those, but you might have 8,000 uh, tracks. And how do you handle that? 
In that case, you have to handle that on your connector. For example, chunking your array and making requests for the different chunks until you have no more data, okay? In the code, I have, a I have an example of that. And again, I'm going to check out the pagination. First, you saw that um, the albums or uh, the data views were exposing uh, on the requester a pagination, no, a pagination, sorry, a report progress information, like I'm retrieving this amount of data, but then I realized it's not part of the requester. It should be part of the uh, data view because the data view know how to paginate. The requester only have to retrieve the data using the parameters you are going to send, okay? And you can see here the code on my Spotify connector doesn't change. The connector doesn't have to know how I paginate. It's a concern of the data view, okay? So we go here on the albums, and this method that previously was very short now has the logic for pagination. How is it handled here? I know this endpoint particularly has offset and limit. And the limit is handled by default on the requester. I don't need to change the limit. I know the limit. The API tells me which is the maximum limit uh, to retrieve the data, so I put it or hard coded or in a constant because I won't change that. I want the maximum amount of data I can retrieve per time. And the only thing I do here is to define the offset, to move the pointer, retrieve the data, analysis here on the response, and I'm getting the items, which is an array. Here I can show you something. This we is not the, another one we of have your analogies, output. right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have the output here of the documentation of uh, Spotify, which is very well documented. And what I'm using is the items. The items are my data that I want to flatten using the mapping, and then sending that to Tableau using data progress callback. And if I have a next property set up, I will continue and using recursion here in that case to call the same function uh, with a new offset. Otherwise, I will end the promise here, resolving it and communicating that to the connector. The connector is using promises to understand if the whole process has been completed successfully or it has a problem. And again, here, the requester, it's only dedicated to wrap the functionalities of uh, the library that gets the data from the API. One important, very important thing is that Tableau, as we said, is just like us. It has a limited amount of memory and if you want to retrieve all the data and then process it, you are gonna kill Tableau. It's just like that, it's going to die. Don't and you are Tableau. not going to have a, a clue about what happened rather than a memory explosion, okay? So if you want to download one gigabyte or two gigabytes of data, you have to paginate. You cannot handle that. And again, the user experience is so very important. If you are retrieving a large amount of data, we find out that like 80 or 90% of the time, of processing time of the data is network traffic. And you don't want the user to be there hanging, seeing nothing. You want to paginate and tell them, we are processing 100 rows, 200, 300. I have from the API the total amount of data, so I can tell them, we are on the 80%, 90%, okay? Yeah, actually on the first version of the SDK, there was no way through an API to report progress to the user. So oftentimes we get reports that people thought that Tableau hanged, and it wasn't, it was just like getting data. So, but we had no way to have a delightful user experience. Mm -hmm. That is a nice segue into our next <laughs> uh, 
set of their needs. Stuff can go wrong. Uh, you know, like your connection may die, Spotify may go down, uh, maybe you make a lot of requests to the same API and they throttle you. And so, how do you handle all these situations in a way that you can still uh, document what's happened in the logs to investigate stuff while keeping the user experience a, a graceful one? You know, you let me know what's happening and you don't tell me like, you know, results underscore 529 something something uh, that I don't know about. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we go about doing that stuff? Okay, uh, you have in this case mainly three kind of errors. Uh, one is the API or network error you might find there. Another one is the application error. And there is a third one that is human error. We are humans. We write the code. And sometimes the problem is between the chair and the computer. Uh, for that case, you have linting tool. For example, ESLint that you can attach to your IDE. And it will analyze your code and let you know that there is something wrong. In other cases, you need to analyze or to uh, handle that in runtime. For example, the API <coughs> is down. And for that, uh, the API is most every API, not all, we found cases very strange uh, around there. Uh, but the APIs used to have a way to communicate to you what's happening. Okay? So, in order to handle that, you need to implement uh, some tools there. One of the tools is here, your helper, which will use one of the Tableau features, the log. When you communicate to Tableau, please log me this information. It will create an entry on the log file so you can understand exactly at a developer time what happened with a, an error. There, you can write the whole information you want. I suggest you not to include uh, sensitive information because it's very dangerous. But you can uh, log uh, the line where the error happened or everything you want there. And then in debugging time, you can read those files. Also, we have a tool to uh, read the log in real time while, yeah. while you are running the connector. Um, Another uh, way to communicate the error is that, okay, we have something for uh, the developer and we need something for the user. The user, uh, the user wants to uh, have an action. Not to say, uh, no, they don't want to find an error that says, never happened. That's very ugly. They want to know how can they uh, work around that. In that case, there is the abort for error uh, API on Tableau Shim that will prompt a message to the user telling something has happened. And you can translate your errors to human readable information. Here on the Spotify connector, you can see that I have error helper create error log. That's for the developer. And then for the user, Tableau Shim abort with error custom error message or default error, in case I don't have a custom error message. I will show you a case where we have a custom error message. Uh, where do you think I should define the errors for uh, the interaction with the API? At the data view level? At the connector level? At the requester level? Requester. That's the best way to, to, to do that in this case. I'm just considering the error, okay? In this case, the only thing I'm doing is attaching an error uh, response, error capturing, to the uh, async request, and then iterate over this information I know the library is exposing to me. One of these is the status code. And for each one of these, I can define a custom message on a library. Why I'm using, again, a separate library for the messages or a dictionary for the messages because the beans shouldn't be with the meat. I might want to uh, use i 18 in the future and I don't want to mix everything here, OK? 
I, I just use in my dictionary. And another case is, for example, error 401. That's a common error for uh, uh, wrong authentication. What I can do there is to define a custom action to say reauth, and I abort for authentication and show to the user a message or uh, the login page. Here is another error that uh, some APIs will limit the number of uh, requests you can do per time. And if you exceed that number, they will say to you, you have to wait one minute, two minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. And you can write a custom function to wait there and retry later. And in that case, for example, you don't want the user to know about that. You just want the user to be waiting there until everything is done. Cool. We realize we're having too much fun. We have about five minutes left, so we need Whoa. to hurry up a little bit. Next thing is testing. You know, We trust you. You guys write great code, but we've got to make sure that it's up to the standards uh, that Tableau expects. So, some of the things that we've learned around uh, testing connectors is we do a bunch of unit testing to test the meat and the beans separately. Mm -hmm. Did I get it right? Exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, it's an integration test. That's right. Uh, Javier was one of the first uh, people on my team that sent me a screenshot that said he got to 99.9 .9 code coverage with his unit test. Perfect. Um, and a, a, a fun fact is we, we found something interesting about uh, code coverage. The more code coverage that you have, developers tend to get uh, comfortable with changes. And so we found that uh, anything about 70% code coverage is a sweet spot. You go over to that and people feel comfortable. They, th they say like, oh, tests are going to catch all the bugs. And so they take more risk. And so we find more bugs the more code coverage that you have. Uh, that was just a fun fact. Um, we do integration testing. Uh, using the simulator sometimes. Um, there the drawback is you may find bugs in Tableau that don't happen in the simulator because of different browsers uh, or vice versa. Uh, and last but not least, we've uh, automated some end-to-end -end scenarios uh, to test the whole workflow for different connectors. Now these tests are uh, expensive to write and, uh, and, and they break uh, a bunch, so we don't have a lot of them, uh, but they help with regression. And so I think what you have today, it's sort of like a, a preview, work in progress, if you yes. will, of uh, what would it look like to have a comprehensive set of unit tests for the Spotify connector. Perfect. So here uh, I will talk about two concepts very quickly. One is uh, testing, and the other one is tech debt. Uh, in this case, I will show you both, because I just wrote <laughs> only a few tests instead of all the tests I needed to write uh, for the TC. I didn't have time. I promise I will implement more tests in the future. And since it's open source, you're welcome to contribute to that. <laughs> and as you can see on the, sorry, it's not this one. You know the session's getting recorded, so you just promised. I know that. <laughs> that. OK, just making sure. But I can speak in Spanish and say, yo no fui. <laughs> I didn't do it. OK, as you can see, uh, we are using Jest. It's a very, very powerful library that allows you to define a granular way to uh, test your application. There are different ways uh, to test your application. You can use Snapchat. Uh, you can run integration tests on your side, depending on your implementation or unit testing. In this case, there are only unit testing and they are not so well written. Uh, you can contribute there. Again, they all pass, but there is something. As Mari said, there is a coverage. Okay? We want to know the surface we were covering on our tests. And just allow you to define that on a configuration file. As you can see, I'm setting just 50%, and I wasn't able even to uh, fulfill that. And the, te the test is failing because I'm not complying to that contract. This is very useful because in a production quality, you can attach your tests before your deployment uh, tool. 
it's in your pipeline, you run the tests. If all the tests run pass, then you uh, upload the information to the uh, continuous integration serv server, and then it will deploy the information to the web. Yeah. In fact, sometimes what we've done is we add the test runner as a code reviewer for changes. And so if the test runner fails, it won't pass your code review. Exactly. Uh, which comes pretty handy. Or you can remove the test from the continuous integration mm -hmm. so you can deploy. All right. Perfect. So here you have everything until now to create your own code. There is uh, some uh, more extra information regarding how to refresh your data. There is no code yet for that. Then again, I'm promising to have, this is tech debt <laughs> again. <laughs> and the problem with tech debt is that when you realize you have too much tech debt, it's like the credit card you can pay. I'm the debt collector. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. So for refreshing your data, you know, you can do it manually, you can scale that on server. WCs are extract only. Um, and then we highly recommend that uh, you use incremental refreshes to not bring all the data every time that you refresh that. And as Javier said, that will happen before the end of the year. Thanks, Javier, for that. Yeah. Um, it really depends on the API also. Because if you, for example, want to download the last week, and there are some APIs that won't allow you to download the last week, you will need to find some very creative ways to incrementally refresh your data instead of downloading the whole data. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, your brains didn't explode with too much information. Uh, again, the, the intention uh, for this talk is to have uh, some context around reference material that you can use to get started. Go steal our code, make it your, your own, get in trouble, uh, contribute back, uh, and see what you can do with it. Um, like I said before, there's another talk about writing your first uh, WDC. It's at 3.30 today. Yeah. Some uh, of the contents, we assume you know, uh, they are very well explained there. Yeah. And we'd really enjoy if you give feedback about the talk. We take that super seriously. Um, last year, Javier and I, uh, based on the feedback that we got uh, from everybody, we completely rehauled the, the session. People wanted to see more code. Where's the code? And so we brought the code, baby. Uh, so if you have comments, if you have feedback, we'd love to hear it um, so to help us like, do better next year. Thank you very much, and uh, we hope that you have a great rest of TC.